Hey, my name is Stefan Nagy. I'm a PhD student at Virginia Tech, and I'm here to present our paper, Full Speed Fuzzing. This is a joint collaboration between my advisor, Dr. Matthew Hicks, and myself. So hopefully today we'll help get you excited about our efforts to improve fuzzing performance. Uh -oh. Can we advance the slide? All right. So as we've discussed already in this session, fuzzing is a very uh, fundamental, <clears throat> excuse me, and time-tested technique to finding software bugs and vulnerabilities. It's very widely used by developers um, and attackers alike. It spawned many numerous tools like AFL, HongFuzz, and LibFuzzer, each of these with very impressive track records of disclosing vulnerabilities. <clears throat> it's very popular in the software industry. So big corporations like to use fuzzing to find bugs and vulnerabilities in their software, both pre and post release. Um, and it's becoming very accessible to developers in the form of cloud platforms. And by far the most popular approach in fuzzing is called coverage guided fuzzing, which at a high level operates given as follows. So given a target application has some test cases for it, the fuzzer executes these target application, sorry, these test cases against the target application and measures each one of their code coverage, basically how far they get in the target application's code. <clears throat> and test cases which increase code coverage are preserved, meaning they've found some new um, part of the code that the other ones have not. Um, and all those which don't are simply discarded along with their code coverage. And the end goal of this process is to kind of exhaustively um, traverse the program code and find those few test cases that trigger bugs or vulnerabilities. Now, to date, a lot of work has gone into improving this test case generation process to mutate test cases better so that they penetrate deeper regions of the code. Um, but our focus is on improving this test case generation process. And we observed that identifying coverage increasing test cases requires the, the tracing of code coverage for every single test case, yet only a very small handful of these actually increase code coverage. The overwhelming majority, along with their code coverage, are simply just junked and discarded by the fuzzer. And <clears throat> additionally, given this fact, as well as, as our results show that this process of tracing every test case adds some pretty non-negligible overhead over the course of fuzzing an application, we see this as having a, a huge um, potential for improvement and that these resources could be much better used elsewhere to find bugs in the fuzzing workflow. And this is where coverage guided tracing fits in. So rather than tracing every one of those single test cases to find the few that are coverage increasing, we restrict tracing to just those that are coverage increasing, that small, small fraction. And as a result, we were able to dramatically cut down this overall overhead to about three tenths of a percent. And because we focus on simply filtering out test cases before they are traced, we, we would easily complement these great approaches which uh, try to generate test cases better or make tracing faster by other means. So our first question going into this project was how are coverage increasing test cases found? And the answer is fuzzers trace the coverage of every single test case. And they do this through instrumentation inserted either dynamically or statically. And generally, any kind of dynamic instrumentation is far, far slower than any kind of static instrumentation approach. Um, but another limiting factor is, is uh, the availability of the program source code. So you're able to instrument in these kind of white box techniques, which we see as encompassing uh, kind of compile and assembly time instrumentation. That's generally much, much faster than any kind of binary only or black box approach as we refer to it in the paper. So going on from that, we wanted, oh, that's kind of loud. Going on from that, we wanted to um, identify how do fuzzers actually spend their time while they're trying to find bugs in an application. So we profiled AFL, which is kind of the standard naive based fuzzing approach, as well as Driller, which is an advancement that um, complements these kind of naive fuzzing techniques with a more uh, technical symbolic execution approach. Um, and we looked at black box Kimu based tracing for both AFL and Driller because that's all that Driller supported at the time, uh, as well as Clang's out of the box assembly time white box tracing approach. And we profiled these one hour executions for eight benchmarks per configuration. And we discovered that across every one of these configurations, um, over 90% of fuzzer time was spent on tracing uh, and, and executing these test cases. So, from there, we were thinking, okay, that's a, that's a pretty overwhelming majority of time. That must mean that you know, a lot of these test cases are actually coverage increasing. And to our surprise, that's quite far from the truth. So on average, less than three out of 10,000 of these test cases actually increase code coverage. So the other 9,000 
997 were completely just discarded. So going on from there, we were thinking, okay, one hour is kind of short. Let's try 24 hours. That's kind of the standard evaluation trial uh, for fuzzers. So we looked again at AFL Kimu. <clears throat> we collected five 24-hour test case dumps per eight benchmarks, uh, and we discovered that actually it, it decreases exponentially. So as you kind of push past and fuzz, you're easy to reach regions of the target application's code. It becomes exponentially less likely that you will find test cases which, which reach new code coverage. So on average, this ended up being at most one out of 10,000 test cases on average. So very, very low. So from here, the overall impact is, you know, okay, we're tracing over, sorry, we're spending over 90% of fuzzer time on tracing these test cases, yet over 99.99% of these are completely just discarded by the fuzzer. So this is analogous in our eyes to trying to find the needle in the haystack by taking a magnifying glass to every single piece of hay. It's just not efficient whatsoever. But why is tracing code coverage so expensive in the long run? Well, the answer is you're storing coverage for many, many parts of the program code. So this kind of operates, you know, given you're, you're executing the program, you hook every single basic block and you store that it has been covered in this kind of data structure. AFL uses bitmaps, arrays are also a common way of doing this. And then you return control flow back to the, to the basic block, finish executing the rest of it, and then move on to the next basic block. Um, but the problem is this adds, this, this process of fetching and writing to this data structure adds many, many instructions uh, to the overhead of this basic block. And because you have many basic blocks in modern applications and execution paths are long and contain all this kind of looping behavior, this overhead very quickly adds up over time. So it is, it is costly to do this excessively. And this is where coverage guided tracing tries to fit in and solve this problem. So our guiding intuition is that um, rather than tracing test cases to find coverage, that way we want to find the few coverage increasing test cases without having to trace every single one of these test cases generated. So rather than using a magnifying glass on every single piece of hay, we're just gonna stick our hand in there, get poked, and then realize we found the few coverage increasing test cases that way. So it's a lot more efficient. So how this looks like on a micro scale, so we, instead of relying on tracing instrumentation, we use interrupts. So in this application here, let's say we want to track the coverage of block B1, this kind of starting uh, point of the control flow graph. Um, and we would write the first hex byte of it with an interrupt. So as the test case triggers that, uh, sorry, executes that basic block, it will trigger the interrupt, and thus we know that it has increased code coverage. So now we want to ensure that no future test cases with the same code coverage as that first test case will also hit that interrupt and mistakenly, bark, excuse me, mistakenly be marked as coverage increasing. We will reset that basic block and move on. So remove the interrupt so that no future executions going through that basic block will trigger the interrupt and no other test cases will be mistakenly marked as coverage increasing. So how this looks like on a, on a macro scale, we want to only trace those few coverage increasing test cases and simply filter out the rest based on them not hitting any interrupts whatsoever. So given the target application, we would modify it statically and apply these interrupts before we even run it. And then the first test case that hits an interrupt, we would trace it, then find all of its uh, basic blocks that it would hit in a normal execution using a separate binary, and then remove all the interrupts uh, respectively in this interrupt binary, and then move on to the next test case. So what happens over time is that as you encounter more coverage increasing test cases, more interrupts are removed. So as these interrupts become removed, these two binaries start to mirror each other structurally for all, for all intents and purposes. So what ends up happening is that as, as fewer test cases, as the likelihood of finding coverage increasing test cases drops, uh, the overwhelming majority, we call this the common case, the non-coverage increasing test cases, will be run without anything interesting happening between enter and exit of this binary. No interrupts, no tracing, nothing. And they will be run at 0% over at native execution speed. So we're basically only tracing the few coverage increasing test cases and running the rest without any overhead whatsoever. So how this looks like as we incorporate it into coverage-guided fuzzing. So we insert this filter right after this test case generation process and before this coverage tracing step. Um, so here, for every test case that you generate, you would execute it first on this application with these interrupts inserted. And for the overwhelming majority that simply do not trigger interrupts, we would just throw them away at that step without even having to trace them. And for the few that do, 
Uh, we would run them on this tracing binary, we would extract their coverage and remove the interrupts accordingly. So again, over time, as you encounter more coverage increasing test cases, interrupts are removed, and the common case is run on a binary without any um, extra overhead, so native execution speed in the common case. In our implementation, which we call on Tracer, uh, we use the static rewriting black box space tracing approach to Dynance for tracing these few coverage increasing test cases. So moving on to our evaluation, uh, our first question was we want to strictly isolate the tracing overhead of coverage guided tracing and compare it to these other kind of de facto approaches that, that fuzzing relies on for tracing test cases. So we looked at some of the most common approaches, um, Dynast and Kimu and, and AFL's assembly time. So there's a mix of black and white box based tracing approaches as well as our coverage guided tracing framework on Tracer. Uh, and to isolate overhead, we uh, use single core virtual machines to eliminate any kind of operating system interference. Uh, we stripped AFL to just its tracing code, uh, and we selected pretty diverse benchmarks to kind of good, uh, have a varied model of real-world behavior. And we compared the tracer execution times um, across five days' worth of test cases, one test case at a time. Uh, so five days' worth of test cases per benchmark and five trials per each one of these days' worth of test cases per benchmark. So these are our benchmarks, and as you can see, we wanted to very carefully select benchmarks that were of varying type, varying file format, but most importantly, uh, varying code. So no benchmarks here are from the same package or library. So we wanted to very carefully have a good variety of benchmarks. And our first evaluation question here was, how, can, how does coverage guided tracing compare to uh, tracing every test case with a black box tracing approach? And we actually beat them by quite a bit. So in comparison to these approaches which trace using a slow tracer every single test case, uh, the fact that we are only tracing these few coverage increasing test cases brings us down to about three tenths of a percent of overhead. So okay, we were thinking that you know, this is a pretty good reduction. How do we compare it to kind of the, the fast tracing approaches that, that white box tracing offers for fuzzing? And from there, we, we looked at AFL Clang, AFL's out of the box assembly time, based tracing approach, um, and we discovered that we actually beat them by quite a bit, so about 36% reduction compared to um, the, one of the fastest based tracing approaches right now. And the interesting thing is that although AFL Clang by itself has lower overhead than Dynast, which is what we relied on, the fact that we were using Dynast so sparingly gave us such a strict advantage over AFL Clang, which, although it was faster, traced every single test case. So this gives some credence as to how coverage guided tracing has a direct impact on reducing overhead across uh, fuzzing all these different test cases. So our next question was, okay, how does this reduction in overhead impact the overall fuzzer throughput? So our goal here was to measure the total number of test cases done in a pretty reasonable amount of time. So again, uh, we looked for 24 hours across eight benchmarks, uh, five trials each. We used QSIM, um, which is a very advanced kind of hybrid fuzzer, similar to Driller. It basically combines concolic execution alongside these naive fuzzing approaches. Um, and we discovered that uh, the fact that coverage guided tracing reduces tracing over it so much because it only traces coverage increasing test cases gave it a decisive advantage um, in tracing, sorry, in, in producing more test cases overall than uh, QSIM using Kimu to trace every test case and QSIM using uh, AFL's assembly time white box tracing for every single test case. So pretty big reduction uh, in overhead results in a pretty big advantage in number of uh, test cases pr uh, able to, to be executed over time. So to conclude, why is coverage guided tracing such a good complement to these other approaches? So we know that fuzzers spend a lot of their time finding coverage increasing test cases by tracing every single one of them and comparing each of their coverage to some globally stored coverage over time. Um, and that this amounts to about over 90% of their time on average across you know, naive and intelligent fuzzers alike. Um, yet over 99.99% of these test cases, along with their code coverage, are completely discarded. Uh, we see this as being a huge waste of resources. So in other words, we can better allocate these resources elsewhere in the fuzzing process to help find bugs in different ways. <laughs> 
And this is where coverage guided tracing fits in by trying to restrict uh, code coverage tracing to just those test cases guaranteed to increase code coverage, and we filter out the rest at native execution speed. Um, and this results in a performance advantage. Uh, we reduce the overall overhead of fuzzing execution to about three tenths of a percent. Um, and as a result, we, uh, we boost the overall test case throughput between 70 to 616%, so quite a big advantage there. Um, and because we focus on strictly filtering out test cases, um, and, and just to show we use Dynance, which is a very slow tracing approach, the fact that we are tracing so infrequently means you can, in theory, use whatever tracer you want, whether it's Intel PT or LLVM-based instrumentation, and even bring this overhead down closer to 0% over time. Um, and, and because we focus on, on strictly filtering out test cases, we maintain orthogonality with these other great approaches like Angora and Vuzer, which aim to um, improve the test case generation process. So we're, we work with them. And with that, I would like to welcome you to download, check out, clone, fork our code, integrate it in your fuzzers, and, and get the best throughput possible. So thank you so much. And we have time for questions. Please state your name and affiliation. Uh, Hung Jin from UC Riverside. So the idea of use int3 to trace blocks is not new. OK. So in 2012, I just checked you know, some, in 2012, there's a block, use this idea to trace the coverage. And in fact, in our uh, DARPA CGC team, we use this idea to, for fuzzing. So I don't, when you propose this idea, do you, have you checked that this has been done for years? The only approaches we've seen that use any kind of debugger interrupts were strictly these kinds of software engineering approaches that use it for unit testing. We did not uh, find any approach that used a strictly coverage guided tracing approach to you know, use interrupts at every single basic block and reduce the set of test cases traced. But I'd be happy to talk offline more about. OK, another question. So um, you would talk about the throughput incre uh, increase. Mm -hmm. uh, what did you compare to? Uh, you know, uh, For AFL, it has this uh, forking mechanism, so it kind of skip the Yes, yeah, so um, we, we measure, so for every test case, sorry, I, I, I forgot to include this in uh, my elaboration about it. So we, we had this baseline execution overhead, which was just the fork server, no tracing component whatsoever. Okay. So everything was scaled relative to that. Hey, hi, uh, Lucas Drazel from UCSB, Santa Barbara. Um, so my question is, I can, I can see how this would improve performance in the case for where your coverage metric is basic block coverage. Now, for example, AFL has a coverage metric that is branch-based coverage. Mm -hmm. With you including not tracing every single input that doesn't hit a new basic block, don't you basically remove every coverage metric other than basic block coverage, reducing it to basic block coverage? So the thing about coverage metrics is it's actually, it's a trade-off, fuzzing is all about trade-offs, right? So if you have a deeper coverage metric like AFL does edges and hit counts, you're actually going to be running that data structure a lot more. Um, interestingly, Hong Fuzz, a competing fuzzer, does just basic block level coverage, although they can uh, incorporate edges as well through static transformations. Um, but they do so without hit counts, and that's also a very successful approach. The point is, it's not really clear what the best coverage metric is for finding crashes in a reasonable amount of time on a real world program. So we have some work kind of exploring that right now. So, no, I understand that. I, yeah. I just wanted to know if you had an evaluation of the actual coverage increases over time versus something that, like n native AFL that uses a different code. We focus strictly on, on improving performance, but our code is available, so if you'd like to look at our integration with AFL and compare that to standard AFL, you're, you're more than welcome to. Hi, Paolo Montezel from Polytechnic of Milano. Hi. I was just uh, wondering whether you tried to see how uh, using your approach uh, impacts bug funding, funding sorry. Because I just saw like performance uh, scores, but I haven't seen like bugs. So in our kind of micro evaluations, we saw that we were indeed finding bugs. Um, but because we're not trying to compete with these approaches that focus on better input generation, like Vuzer and Angora and Profuzzer and Nuez in this session, uh, we're just trying to increase their throughput. So we're strictly focusing on, on making tracing as fast as possible, and, and we feel that we would better complement them. So I think a more fair approach would be to, to you know, one of these approaches combined with coverage guide tracing versus the approach uh, you know, kind of natively. Yeah, yeah, I get it. But like, for example, let's say that your approach is faster, but in the end you find less bugs because you remove stuff that might be interesting. 
Have you tried to look at that? So because we're, we're, these fuzzers fundamentally rely on either block or edge coverage, and coverage guide tracing fundamentally can support block or edge coverage, we, we don't think that there's, there's theoretically any reason that we would find less bugs, but. Okay, well, thanks. Yeah. We have time for one more question. Yeah. Yang Jinjiang from Oregon State University. So my question is about like uh, you have used like uh, the debugger interrupt, uh, interrupt to like uh, the check if the, this branch is visited or not. Yeah. But uh, what I think is the more important thing for finding bug is like uh, not just code coverage, like uh, how many times we repeat some of the loops or some of the function executions or something. But uh, from the explanation, what I'm seeing is like uh, you are just uh, care taking caring about the visit or not, not about the like how many times about the the executing of the some of the loops or like a bigger right. program executions. In this regard, I think like it'll be very hard to find some of the bug because like a code coverage itself only tells like a, can we reach to certain points, not about the triggering the vulnerability. So could you share your like a, uh, some yeah, of the insights sure. about the thoughts about like that? So so again, you know, there's no real evaluation that's been done to show whether hit counts or edges, or excuse me, edges or blocks or edges with blocks or blocks with Excuse me. Edges with hit counts or blocks with hit counts is the best metric because you know it's a game of of do I want to sacrifice performance for precision? AFL itself um, does this kind of coarse consideration of hit counts. They use these kind of like very uh, large buckets. Um, we have some work that's trying to definitively answer that question. Um, but as far as addressing hit counts, so because you know coverage guide tracing operates at the block level. Um, we are, you know, incorporating hit counts via static transformations is something that we're kind of exploring right now. So, okay. answer your question. Yeah. All right, we let's can talk thank off the speaker. Line.